You're watching Caribbean Vibrations, and today's episode is about teacher, entrepreneur, publisher, broadcaster, philanthropist, civil rights activist, author, and community leader, Mr. B. Denham Jolly. Born in Jamaica, he immigrated to Canada in 1955 and obtained a science degree from McGill University. He then launched his business career by purchasing and operating rooming houses and nursing homes. As a staunch believer in equality for all black people, Denham became the publisher of Contrast, a black community newspaper in Toronto. He then created Flow 93.5, the first black-owned radio station and the first station in Canada to showcase urban music for the black community. Mr. Jolly has been involved in several community groups, including the Black Action Defense Committee, and he's also the founder of the BBPA, an organization that addresses equity and opportunity for the black community in business, employment, education, and economic development. Mr. Jolly recently won the Toronto Book Award for My Life in the Black and received the Order of Canada in 2020. Stay tuned for our special one-on-one -on -one interview with Mr. Jolly as he shares with us some insights from his past journey while giving us some great advice along the way right now on Caribbean Vibrations. How everybody knows you in the community, they know you as a, as a businessman, but you are the guy that started it. So how were you able to create the first black urban contemporary radio station in Canada? Well, it was uh, tenacity of purpose which is hanging in there. So how was I able to do it? There are usually 12 to 18 competitions from people who have been in the business, people who already have 30, 50 radio stations across the country. And um, there are usually 12 to 18 people that are applying each time. It's a, it's a, it's a long process because you need a lawyer, you need a corporate lawyer, you need a corporation communications lawyer, you need a engineer, you need an office and so on and so forth. But in this case, we had to apply three times and it was with the support of the community and my partners that all made it happen. In fact, they have what they call uh, interventions which are letters of support from the community. But from our community, we had like 14,000 letters of intervention in our first application. The CRTC had never seen so many. And our first application was, you applied for a black radio station. And the first question from the commission to us was, Mr. Jolly, what is black music? So right away we knew we were in trouble. And in the end, the, li the license was given to a country and Western station from out there, or West. So there was a lot of politics. Yeah. And we had to make three applications over 12 years. It was quite a struggle. And in fact, at the end of that uh, the first competition, the chairman of the, the board of the CRTC was the first time it was ever done. He wrote a dissenting opinion from the rest of the commission. And he said that they made a mistake. His commission made a mistake. Okay. And that Toronto needs a black radio station. And not only do they need a black radio station, they should have had one 10 years ago. Wow. Because at the time, there were stations in, in Toronto that they did not play any black music. And some were mandated not to play black music. And if you wanted to hear a black music, you had to tune into Waffle in Buffalo, or if you have a good powerful station, you pick it up from Detroit. In fact, if promoters were putting on a ready concert, say in Toronto, there was no venue for them to advertise. They had to advertise from Buffalo, from yeah. Waffle. And furthermore, we had a lot of artists, yeah. a lot of budding artists. Uh, so we were saying, we want to take all these budding artists out of their basements and out of their garages and put them on mainstream radio. And as they say in Jamaica, so said, so done. We were the first to play Drake. Wow. You know, and with the proliferation of hip hop and reggae and black music, we feel that Flo had some influence in, in encouraging all that. So there was a long, long struggle and a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort and tenacity of purpose. And, and you've, you've said that a couple of times, tenacity of purpose, because what made you feel that purpose? Because like you said, you got rejected twice. You could have given up after the first time or the second time. 
But what kind of made you say, no, this has got to get done and this has got to get done now? Well, you know what? I, I feel, uh, which some people say it's arrogant and so forth, but I feel it's a plus because you can't let the white community define you. Secondly, I feel that we had contributed more than enough to this country. The first black man came to this country 1604 and took down plane up the St. Lawrence River, interpreted for him what the McMaster and whatnot. And we don't owe them anything. And I could go on and on and on of all our contributions to this country. So you, I approach it as if, listen, I'm not begging for anything. We pay taxes. We buy cars, we buy mattresses, we buy stoves. We're as much a supporter of this country as you are. We deserve it. So I didn't give up. I figured, and furthermore, I was a long distance runner. And I figure if you lost your breath, hold on, your second one's coming. Just hold on. And if you lose the second one, that third one's coming too. And I figured, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to let you outlast me. I'm going to outlast you. And I would go to hearings in Coburg and Quebec City and Montreal and sit right in front of the commissioners and let them know, I'm not going to go anywhere, guys. I'm going to be here to haunt you. So that's uh, part of my action plan for them. And that was sort of my raison d'etre at the time. 